Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Math 301, Introduction to Combinatorial Theory. And today we're going to be talking about drawing lines to separate a plane into different regions. This is in section 6.4, and we're going to find a recurrence relation for that and solve that recurrence relation. So let's take a look at the picture with this. So for a plane, you can imagine a piece of paper. You can think about this piece of paper extending off to infinity in all directions, but we can do the same thing with just a regular piece of paper. And in fact, it doesn't matter what size the piece of paper is, which is good because I can't draw four rectangles of the same size on my tablet. The idea here is we're going to let Pn um, be the number of regions that n lines divide a plane into. And there are a few things we need to say about these lines. They can't be overlapping lines, they have to be different lines. And we also want these lines that no three of them should intersect in a point. But that's a way of saying that these lines are in general position. Okay, so here on this piece of paper, we drew one line. And so we can see that P1 is two because this line divided this piece of paper into two regions. From this piece of paper, we can see that P2 is four because here we divided this piece of paper into four regions. From this picture, we can see that P3 is seven. So it's no longer a power of two. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And if you look carefully at this piece of paper, you can see that P4 is 11. So one thing to notice about this is that it doesn't initially look like we have a, a very clear pattern for the values P1, P2, P3, and P4. It's not so clear what would happen if we added a fifth line. One thing to notice is that to get from P1 to P2, we added two. To get from P2 to P3, we added three. And then uh, to get from P3 to P4, we then added four. So let's see why that would make sense. So once we have a line here, why do we keep increasing the number of regions that we add by just a little bit each time? So the next line takes each of the previous two regions and then um, and separates them both in half. One way of seeing that is right around where this line crossed the other line, that was where we could see the division of this top left region into two and this bottom right region into two. So this intersection point was important for understanding why we added two at that point. Now, when we add this next line, it intersects each of the previous two lines. And when it, when it does that, you can see that it divides this region into two parts. It divides this region into two parts. And then over here, it divides this region into two parts. So those, those are why we get three more regions at that step. Okay, and then let's go to this next one here. We drew then this vertical line. Notice that we have three intersection points. And so this segment, this, this line segment separates these two regions. This line segment between these two dots separates these two regions. 
This line segment between these two dots separates these two regions. And finally, this line segment separates these two regions. So what we're gonna conjecture here is that um, is that Pn is whatever the previous value was, that's Pn minus one, plus, and we have to add something. So to find P2, we added two. To find P3, we took the previous value and added three. To find P4, we took the previous value and added four. So this is our conjecture that uh, Pn is the previous value plus n. And if you wanna prove that, here's just a verbal explanation of that proof. Uh, the nth line gives you n line segments Um, between, uh, so there are n minus one spots where it intersects the previous lines. And that divides the line on this paper into n line segments. So these are n minus one line segments coming from the n minus one intersection points with the previous lines. And each of those line segments divides a region that was previously one region into two regions. So we get two new, um, we get we get whatever number of regions we had before, but then n extra ones because we just divided n regions into two n regions. Okay, so that's the explanation for this recurrence relation. One thing to notice about that recurrence relation is that it is not linear because this n is just a number. It's not a multiple of a previous value in the sequence. All right, so we would like to find a closed form for this, for this uh, sequence. So what do we know so far? We know that P1 is two, that's our initial value, and that Pn is Pn minus one plus n. And we have to think about how in the world are we gonna find a closed form from this recurrence relation. So we just want a formula for Pn. So the book has the answer, but it doesn't explain how you find the answer. So let's talk about how you find the answer. First thing to notice is that there's no constant in front of the previous one. So unlike the Tower of Hanoi where we were doubling the previous value, and from that, we got that the leading term would be a power of two. Here, we're just taking the same value as we had before. So that means that somehow, somehow any constant is going to, if you just set all the values in the sequence equal to a constant, that would make this part work out. So in this case, this is going to be the leading term, what's happening from adding n at each step. And the way to think about what this closed form is gonna look like is to think about what kinds of functions have the change, this is the change, somehow like the change, like a derivative, the difference between Pn and Pn minus one is n, which is linear not, not a linear recurrence relation, but just linear, a linear formula. And just like in calculus, how if your change is linear, then your actual function should be a quadratic. 
that's going to happen here too. And so even though we're not going to prove this, what I'm going to tell you is that PN is going to have to look like a quadratic formula, just in the same way that an integral of N would look like would look like a constant times n squared. Um, and then you might have to integrate a constant. So it's going to look like this. So if, this is the general format for what Pn has to look like. But now we need to find what these constants are. OK, so in order to do that, let's go to Sage. You can do it by hand, but it's much easier to do it on the computer. So we're trying to find a formula, which is a times n squared plus b times n plus c. So even though our, so our recurrence relation only needed one initial value. Once we know p1, we could use that recurrence relation to find p2, and then use the recurrence relation to find p3, and then use the recurrence relation to find p4. But if we want to find three constants, we're going to need more than one initial value. We're going to need three initial values. So let's remember that P1 was 2, P2 was 4, and P3 was 7. So I'm going to set up three variables, capital A, B, and C. And we're going to write down what happens if you plug in n equals 1. So when you plug in n equals 1, you get a times 1 plus b times 1 plus c. And we want that to be equal to 2. If you plug in a n being 2, you get a times 2 squared plus b times 2 plus c, and we want that to be 4. If we plug in n equals 3, we get a times 3 squared plus b times 3 plus c should be 7. All right, and then we're going to solve those three equations for those constants. And what we find is that a should be 1 half, b should be 1 half, and c should be 1. And then we could check that. We could check that by just trying what happens when n equals 4. So we're going to plug in a being a half, b being a half, and c being 1. We're also going to plug in n equals 4. And we evaluate that. We get 11, which is great, because that was p4. OK, so now that we have our formula for what we expect this what we expect this function to be, now we can actually try to prove it. So, so what our, our expectation is is that what we what we know is that p1 is 2, and we know that pn is pn minus 1 plus n. That's what we know. And what we want to what we want to show is that is that pn is one half n squared plus one half n plus one. Okay, and so we're going to do this again by induction. So let's check when n equals one. This would be one half times one squared plus one half times one plus one, which is two. So that's the base case. And now we're going to suppose Pn is true. And we're going to show Pn plus 1. Uh, oh, so what do I mean by Pn is true? I really mean that Pn being 1 half n squared plus 1 half n plus 1 is true. And then to show that pn plus 1 is true. Here, remember in the induction thing, we used pn to denote a statement. And here, unfortunately, it's denoting a number. But so what do we want this to be? We want pn plus 1 to be 1 half n plus 1 squared plus 1 half n plus 1 plus 1. OK, so this is the inductive step. And so how are we going to do that? Well, Pn plus 1, we know what it is. We know it's Pn plus n plus 1 by the recurrence relation. 
I made a life a little difficult for myself by supposing PN is true and trying to show PN plus one is true. It would have been a little easier if I had instead supposed PN minus one is true and showed PN was true, but now I'm stuck with this. So let's, let's keep going. So by the recurrence relation, uh, PN plus one is PN plus N plus one. So that's taking the recurrence relation, which we know is true for all N and step substituting N plus one for N. Okay, and now PN by the inductive hypothesis, we know what PN equals. It's one half N squared plus one half N plus one. And then we have this extra N plus one. All right, and now we wanna show that this equals whatever this is. Let's just write this as the left-hand side. And what's the right-hand side equal to? The right-hand side, this mass is equal to one half of n squared plus two n plus one plus one half n um, plus one half plus one. And then we can just match up terms on the left with the terms on the right. So you see that that, that one matches up there. This one half, this one half plus this a half matches up to be this one, this half N matches with that half N the one half of two N that matches with N. And finally, the one half N squared that matches there. And then notice we matched up every term from the left-hand side with every term from the right. So these expressions are equal. That was not my favorite inductive proof, probably not yours either. But in any case, our conclusion then is that we have both a recurrence relation for the number of regions in the plane. And we have a closed form formula for the number of regions in the plane. The closed form formula is better if we wanted to figure out what P of 100 is, because then we could just plug in N equals 100. But we needed the recurrence relation in order to find that closed form formula. And that, that was what really expressed the geometry of a line intersecting other lines in regions of the plane. So the homework in this section, you're gonna instead draw circles in the plane. So for the circles in the plane, you're gonna draw, here's a circle. That divides the plane into two regions. Draw another circle. That divides the plane into one, two, three, four regions. And then, uh, then you keep going, keep going from there. All right, great. We'll see you next time.